computer. Okay, recording is in progress. Great. So, um, uh, welcome. Uh, I am Rabbi Seth Adelson. I presuming I know everybody here, I, um, but I'm glad that you're here to uh, learn a little bit about uh, Jewish music. And so uh, this um, this particular series of lunch and learn is uh, is really special to me uh, because I am, uh, as you know, I'm not just a rabbi; I'm also a cantor, um, and uh, I I do love Jewish music. Uh, and in fact, my my entry point in ju into Judaism was music more so than it ever was, um, shall we say, uh, learning Torah. Um, my my Torah, my my point of Torah. Uh, was uh, initial entry was was uh, was music my initial entry point and in fact by the way just to, to draw that point home um, when I applied for rabbinical school at the uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary I uh, um, I I was uh, I at my committee interview uh, you, they asked you to prepare a uh, Dvar Torah you know something to to share with the uh, with the committee you know they want to see how you deliver a Dvar Torah so. Uh, so I, the, the, the Dvar Torah I gave was on a musical subject. And in fact, it was it was related to, I, I think a few of you might have been at Minyan this morning. I, I mentioned it and I, uh, it'll, th this will sort of come up again later today. But it was about the origin of the melody that we think of as uh, that for Shirat Hayam, uh, the melody that we often sing here at Beth Shalom that goes, Az Yashir Moshe Uvene Yisrael. It's the, um, the passage in the Torah in, in the book of uh, Exodus uh, about the, the song that the Israelites sing upon having crossed the Sea of Reeds of dry land. And one of the things that I had learned uh, in cantorial school, remember I'm at the end of cantorial school and I'm applying to rabbinical school um, and uh, at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And uh, one of the things I learned in cantorial school was that there was a scholarly paper that somebody had written about the history of that melody in particular and how the Ashkenazi melody and the Sephardic melody were actually connected, but separated by a game of telephone that went back about a thousand years to the point where the Ashkenazi community formed when Jews from Italy moved northward into France and Germany, and then Jews from Italy also moved to the west uh, across the lower part of France and into Spain. Uh, and uh, and they carried this melody with them, or the kernel of it. Um, and the way it developed in these Spanish-speaking lands is similar but different from the way that it developed in the Ashkenazi lands to the north and eventually to the east. And uh, and so I gave this uh, this sort of scholarly Dvar Torah about you know this connection to our past and, and so forth. Um, and uh, and one of the rabbis on the committee uh, 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 turns to me at the end and says, "So is that Torah?" <laughs> I said, well, yes, of course, music is Torah. So um, uh, my 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 entry point uh, into this is is music, of course. But even way before cantorial school, um, the thing that always drew me into uh, synagogue services was certainly the singing and the music uh, and and learning that and learning to sing along and and so forth. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that love with you. Um, I just wanted to give you a taste of, uh, of, of my own story. Uh, at, at some point when I lived in Israel, I, I, I developed a, an affection for Israeli pop music, and we'll be certainly talking about that at some point. But I also remember from my, I, I don't know if any, any of you, are, are any of you familiar with the, uh, the group Safam? There was this group in the 70s and 80s that uh, they were based in Boston. I don't know if they ever made it as far west as Pittsburgh. You know, they were popular the, in, in New England and in New York. Um, and, uh, and, and so they wrote Jewish music that was both sort of liturgical and also sort of just pop music um perhaps their best known hit hit if you will was we are leaving mother russia we have waited far too long you know that uh, that was a, a a tune from you know in the in the early 80s when we were agonizing over the plight of soviet jews that was a song that sort of resonated with with much of american jewry um so that was a you know an entry point for me we had all of safam's records we saw them perform a, a couple of times. records uh if anyone here not know what a record is uh, um uh, not 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 calling anybody out but there, there used to be these black things made of vinyl um anyway so uh um so the 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 entry point for me was always music and that's how i ended up in cantorial school first um a lot of other stories in there that i don't have time to share with you but uh, but my entry point was music i i subsequently learned in cantorial school that hey this whole torah thing isn't so bad either so uh, so so here we are um but uh but 
in the past, most of these Lunch and Learn series have been, last year we did the Prophets, we've done ha Halakha, we've done uh, um, Teshuvot of the Conservative Movement, we've done Talmud. Um, this is the first time we're doing a musical subject. And I, I, um, I, I only mention this because it's a little, somewhat of a departure from the kinds of things we've done. I will be giving musical examples. I'll be playing some stuff uh, and singing my, some stuff myself, but I've also got a whole bunch of musical examples queued up for today that we'll, we'll be playing as we go through. Um, some are available on YouTube, some uh, in other locations, and uh, we'll share with you as, as we go. Um, so before we get started, as a reminder that this is Torah, we should say the bracha for Torah study, la sok b'divrei Torah. So please, if you've not yet recited it today, um, because remember that is our, our obligation to engage with words of Torah every single day, uh, as soon as we can, please recite the bracha with me. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kideshanu b'mitzvotav vitzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Uh, praise to God who's given us the framework of mitzvot that has enabled us to fill our lives with holiness and given us the particular imperative to engage with words of Torah. Words and, I might add, um, and melodies uh, of Torah. So we're going to do a little of that today. Um, so uh, once again, I apologize we're not broadcasting Facebook Live. We'll, we'll, uh, this recording will make available uh, through our website after the, fast, uh, after the fact. Okay, so um, the first thing uh, that you should know about we're going to we're going to cover a little history first, and and uh, the first thing you should know about Jewish musical history is that of course Jews have been singing as long as there have been Jews. Well, I guess probably you could say that about people. People have been singing as long as there have been people, uh, and so music has always been an essential part of what we do. Now the now in the ancient world, our sources tell us that. Um, that music was a part, it was certainly always a part of rich, of Jewish ritual. And I should say, even before there was what we call Jewish ritual, there was Israelite ritual. And we know from, uh, from, a, from sources attested to, certainly in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, but also in the Talmud, that there was singing going on in the Jewish temple. Um, and even before the Jewish temple, I mentioned just a minute ago, Shirat Hayam, and I'm going to share my screen here so you can see what I'm talking about. Shirat Ayam is, of course, in the book of Exodus. And uh, let me make sure I got the right thing here. Let's do this. That's not going to help us, though. We're going to close you. And we're going to go over to here. Um, so, uh, so if you look at a, 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 a printed version of Chumash today, you will see something that looks that is laid out in this way. But this is actually a shot of what that what any Torah scroll looks like when you get to Shirat Hayam, the song, that song of redemption that the Israelites sang upon having crossed the Sea of Reeds on dry land. And you'll see when you're reading the Torah, those of you who've been close to a Torah scroll know that mostly it looks like what's on either side of this. Can you see my cursor when I'm doing that? You can see the cursor. Okay, good. So in the middle here, though, you'll see this is the Shirat Hayam. And in fact, if I zoom in a little, you, uh, it's a little blurry, I know, but um, you'll see that that uh, that right up there is, we sing this um, many mornings at Beth Shalom. Az Yashir Moshe Uvene Yisrael et Ashir Azod Ladonai Ve'omru Leimor. Now the reason it's ra laid out in this so-called brick pattern is because it, it's easily identifiable to uh, to anyone looking at the scroll that this is a song. It's not the standard prose of the Torah, okay? Uh, and there are a couple of such passages in the Torah. This is one of them. Uh, the one that we read on the Haftarah, we, this is from Parshat B'Shalach, by the way, which we generally generally read on uh, on uh, Shabbat Shira, the song, uh, the, the Shabbat of song. Uh, and we also read another song on that day, which is Shirat Dvorah for the Haftarah. That's the song chanted uh, by uh, the prophetess Devorah uh, in celebration of her military victory uh, over the, the Canaanite uh, forces. So, um, so we do know that 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 brick pattern suggests, and, and remember, the Torah scroll predates the, the way that the Torah is is laid out. That is that's very old. Okay, it's not it's not it may not go back to you know when when the Israelites crossed the Sea of Reeds, which would have been you know maybe twenty. 300 years, sorry, 3,300 years ago, over three millennia ago, um, if we are to believe the traditional uh, um, uh, timeline. Um, and, uh, and so the, um, that, that it, it, it would have been known uh, at, at the time the Torah is written down, which is, which is probably, and if you're looking at this timeline right here, we're over here. Um, and uh, the, 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 the exodus from Egypt is out over here before the timeline begins. This is about 3,000 years ago. Uh, and the Torah is 
taking shape in this area here. Okay, you see, I've got written here the biblical period. So um, the Torah text continues to develop to some extent. I, I, this isn't necessarily so clear, um, but it's it's certainly only letters and no musical notation, no trope marks until until over in here, uh, the the sixth through ninth centuries CE, when a group of scholars known as the Masoretes put all those things that we call trope marks uh, into the Torah. For example, actually, if you look over here, I've got a shot of Psalm one fifty. Um, and there are these little these little guys over here, these little other symbols that are not vowels. Um, those symbols are, we refer to as tamami kra or trope marks. But that's that's actually much later. Um, the Torah scroll that we saw earlier that's probably what um, Torah scrolls have looked like for maybe two thousand years. We don't we don't really know. Um, and certainly when this was chanted uh, in public, it had it had music. And in fact. Typically, the way that it was that it would have been chanted in the ancient world is that somebody probably made hand symbols that were associated with it, that were sort of an oral, oral and visual tradition uh, as to how the text should be chanted. That system is known as chironomy. Chironomy is this symbol of, uh, of uh, like, you know, um, um, the, the, like this thing right here, if somebody went like that, it would mean, you know, do this, you'd make this da -da kind of a melody. Um, and, uh, and, and actually chironomy is something that was not unique to the, to the Jews, the Israelites, it was, it was uh, available throughout many different cultures had uh, chironomic symbols to give, <clears throat> to help people chant their, <clears throat> uh, their liturgical texts. So uh, it was not unique to the Jews. Eventually, um, those symbols were written down. That what the Masoretes were doing in the 6th through ninth centuries is actually taking those chironomic hand symbols, those gestures, and applying them and actually writing them on uh, and above and below the text of the Torah, along with, by the way, the vowels. The Masoretes created the vowels as well um, because they needed a system to indicate how do you exactly pronounce this. Up to then, it had been an entirely oral tradition. And we're not clear, by the way, if those chironomic symbols were just for punctuation, or were they musical as well? It's, there, there's some scholarly debate about this. Certainly one level of the trope marks is to actually separate words and push them together in a way that the text makes sense. Okay, so, so part of the Masoretes work was to define verses, define phrases, using those symbols, but also they served as a kind of musical notation. Now, that music was not written down anywhere. There wasn't a system. Maybe those symbols in the ancient world meant particular things. Uh, and in fact, if you look at, um, there's a, I may not have one queued up over here, but there's a, there's a symbol that looks like a little, a little Z um, that is actually a stairway. And, and in fact, the Masoretes term for it is the Darga, which literally means a step. Um, and, uh, and, and you'll know that if, if you know anything about Torah reading, you'll hear people today chant, Darga. Um, and it sounds like you're going up and you're going down a stair. And, uh, and that, that Darga, that form, that, that musical form actually appears in many of the ways in which that, that, uh, that symbol is chanted. Um, remember that um, I, I know the Eastern European musical tradition, synagogue musical tradition, including the Ta'amami Kra, the trope marks, and uh, and the and the way that synagogue uh, music is chanted. Um, I will uh, we, we'll we'll talk more about uh, that you know uh, next in our next session about synagogue music in particular. I wanted to mention one more thing. There's a question here: of the trope symbols remain fairly consistent over time. Um, there, there actually were, thank you, Lauren, for the question. There are actually multiple different trope symbols, systems. Um, there were at least three. There was the, uh, what's known as the Tiberian system, which is the one we use, which is created in the, by the group of Masoretes around the, around the Sea of Galilee in the north of Israel and, and in the city of Tiberias. Um, there was a Babylonian system created in Iraq. There was also a Yemenite system that was different. that was created by the Jews of Yemen. Um, and so there are, there are a couple of different uh, symbols systems. And, and by the way, they all had different uh, musical sounds. Another ancient musical piece that you should know about is that while the temple was standing in Jerusalem, so uh, let's go back to the timeline here. So remember that the first temple is built uh, out, out hereabouts uh, by King Solomon around the middle of the 10th century BCE, and it stands until the Babylonians destroyed in 586. It's rebuilt starting around here, and then the, the, that second temple is, uh, is destroyed here by the Romans in 70 CE. So all of that time, basically all of these more than 1,000 years, um, the primary mode of Israelite or Jewish ritual is 
temple sacrifices taking place in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, they didn't have prayer the way that we have prayer. prayer. Our prayer is understood to be, by the way, a replacement for that after the temple was destroyed. But during the temple ritual, while they're sacrificing animals, and sometimes grain and sometimes oil, um, there are, there's a Levitical choir and there are uh, who are who are singing, and they're they're singing as antiphonal. That is to say, you got some Levites over here who are singing one line, and another group that's re repeating that line. Um, also, we know that there were instruments that were played in the temple every single day, including, by the way, Shabbat. Okay, um, a group of instruments, and by the way, some of those instruments are identified in this Psalm 150, which is the reason that I have it queued up here. We sing this every morning. In fact, our our um, one of the instructions from the Talmud is that you have to complete reading the Book of Psalms every day. Now, of course, we don't. We usually just sing the last six, uh, and some and on Shabbat we sing a few more of this of the, uh, from the Book of Psalms. But this one is always the last one, and we always we often sing this about Shalom. Um, you know. Hallelujah, hallelujah, el bekodsho, not an ancient melody. I'm just you know, make, making sure that you understand what I'm talking about. In the middle of this, um, this psalm, uh, it, there are identified many instruments that were used in the temple, including the shofar and the nevel, which is a harp, and kinor, which to speakers of, of, of modern Hebrew will think it was a violin, but it was probably more like a lute or a lyre. Um, we have the uh, tof machol, drum and dance. Dance was also an integral part of uh, synagogue service and, uh, and, and ancient Jewish music. Um, minim, ugav, lute and pipe. Um, and tzil uh, shama, um, the tzil tzilim are are symbols. And in fact, that's a, that's a, that's what we call an onomatopoeia, right? That tzil tzilim sounds like kind of like the noise that 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 symbols make. Um, so, uh, and uh, of course, you also know that uh, that word tru'a, which is related. We think of that as being associated with shofar. All musical notation. Many of the psalms, by the way, have little uh, insipid words. The introductory words that that often indicate a key or a mode, a musical mode in which the, uh, that psalm would have been chanted in the temple uh, along with those instruments. And, uh, and so um, those instruments, except for the shofar, we don't really know what any of those ancient instruments are. We think we sort of know how they uh, might have looked. Um, certainly their tuning wouldn't be what we hear as Western ears, you know, it would have been very different. We have no idea what it sounded like. Um, Audrey asked, does one symbol mean the small finger symbols that I once heard? I have no idea what these symbols look like, and nobody really does. But yes, I mean, a symbol is pretty much a symbol, we think, you know, so um, so probably made of metal, probably, uh, you know, um, crashed together or maybe hit with a stick or something. Uh, Lucas asked, how exactly was the musical modality indicated? Um, so uh, that I can show you just, uh, let me see if I can find it, or just a random example. In most so many psalms, I don't want to say most, but you'll see at the beginning a little note up front that will say something like, like Mizmor le David, for example, a psalm of David. Many people think that might mean this is ascribed to David for, um, for because uh, David, King David was the author, maybe, or it might actually mean that this was the, the, um, this was the musical mode that David was known to have used. Um, so you'll see, for example, here's another one, Lamanat Serh le David, Mizmor. Um, so Lamanatzer means for the conductor or for the leader, but it might also be a, a musical hint, like this is how this is supposed to be chanted. There are there are several of them, um, and uh, those are just a few examples. But there there are others that uh, that I if I had prepared for that I would have I, I would have picked out for you. But trust me, uh, there are there are little little uh, notes at the beginning often of psalms that tell us this is the musical mode uh, in which they would have chanted. Um, so we mentioned instruments and choir. The thing is, we have no idea what any of that would have sounded like. You know, there are no recordings, obviously, from 2000 years ago. Uh, there's no musical written notation except for these little hints that we have that we can't really interpret today. The earliest form, by the way, you might wonder when. So when when do we uh, when's the first the, the earliest piece of music that we're actually really familiar with? Uh, and uh, that that piece comes from, interestingly enough, a um, a, a, a fellow named Ovadia Hager, Ovadia the proselyte, the, the convert. Um, Ovadia was, uh, was, uh, was an Italian monk, an Italian monk, get this, this is great, Italian monk who discovered Judaism uh, in the late 11th century. So he's born around 1070, uh, and, he, um, and he is um, uh, he, he's born around 1070, and he, uh, because he's a monk, Monks had musical notation that they used for their ritual purposes. 
uh, and uh, and Ovadia um, wrote heard he actually travels ultimately to Egypt uh, and and to Israel and travels all over the the um, the Middle East. Um, uh, you know, uh, after he converts to Judaism, uh, and and he and he maybe he's a singer, I don't know, but uh, but he he um, this is actually a piece of uh, that is written in Ovadia Hager's handwriting. Uh, this was this this fragment was found in the Cairo Geniza. The Cairo Geniza was a a long standing uh, collection of 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 holy objects and 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 papers and manuscripts that were collected in a synagogue in a suburb of Cairo known as Fustat. Uh, that was discovered in the late 19th century and primarily excavated by the uh, or, or um, studied by Solomon Schechter. That's a name that should resonate. Rabbi Solomon Schechter, Doctor Rabbi Solomon Schechter, um, who was a scholar at Cambridge in in England and ultimately uh, came and 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 uh, was the founder of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, which is where I studied to be both a cantor and a rabbi. And this document, I believe, which is one of Avadia Hager's um, uh, manuscripts is in the Jewish Theological Seminary Library in the rare book room. So, so what's going on here? You can see it says, Mi al har chorev. This is a, an, a piyut, an ancient liturgical poem. Um, who upon Mount Chorev, who, who is speaking of Moses, who, up, who is up on uh, Mount Chorev, which is another name for Sinai. And, uh, and these, it's hard to see, but these little things, little squiggles above um, the line are the uh, are actually the musical notation that are called um, neums n e u m e s neums neums uh, and that was a that was a Christian um, uh, uh, liturgical tradition for writing out their music. Now, what did this sound like? Well, so scholars have sort of reconstructed this, and there happens to be a uh, recording that was made. Oh, you know what? Hold on, I have to. In order to do this, I have to make sure I do this properly because otherwise you won't hear it well. So I have to share sound, right? So I'm doing this again. Okay, great. So I'm going to play for you um, some of this. We'll just get a sense of, of what we're listening to. Okay, everybody ready? The violin part is not in the music. Maybe somebody created that. So remember, we're, we're listening to something from the 11th century. that because we got a lot of other musical examples to get to but that's that is um again blast out of the 11th century you know it's very very unique to be able to find something like that um really jewish music doesn't is not really written down until uh, much later after the 14th century 15th century and in fact there's a series when, when of ultimately um some composers or uh, or singers or chazanim start to write down music um, they are their their initial thing. The, the the first things that they're writing down, and we know this from people who've done this kind of scholarship, are uh, what we call Mycenae tunes. That they're well, there's a lot of stuff that they that they write down, but among them we find that there are melodies that we still use, still know and use today. So among them, for example, would be Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre is a very very old tune. It's one of those melodies, and and by the way. Um, 
the, one of the reasons that Kol Nidre is still around is because the less you use a melody, the more likely it is to be preserved. I know that sounds ironic, but the, the, the more you use a melody, the more likely it is to change because we, we have an oral tradition and in oral traditions, um, things, you know, it's like, like the game of telephone, you know, although played out over centuries. And while, you know, a melody might not change so much in, um, in a decade or a century, over, over 10 centuries, it can change quite a bit, depending on, you know, the people who are singing and their accents and what they're hearing on the outside and all, all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, I see there was lots of, there was lots of, there was lots of chat going on. Um, oh, great. Uh, just commentary on the, uh, on the music. Haunting and mournful, certainly. Uh, and actually, it's haunting and mournful all the more so because of the fact that we're, we're looking back nearly a thousand years, which I think is pretty well listening, I should say, listening back um, that long. Um, so I wanted to, uh, so that's that's one, just one example. Um, I mentioned, um, yeah, uh, those Mycenae tunes, another melody that we know is, is very old. And in fact, some say it's perhaps the oldest piece that we know that has been handed down to us is the High Holiday Torah Trope melody. So uh, for example, that goes, Merecha Tipecha Munachet Nachta, no, hold on, uh, I'm singing, I'm singing, uh, uh, I, I sometimes it's easy to get that was Esther. Uh, oh boy, uh, oh boy, I, I, I can't get it out of my head. So this is a real problem. What you're doing trope is that you have to you have to keep them all separate. Um, that's the high holiday. You know, if you, if you come on high holidays, that's how you hear the Torah chanted. Now, the reason, again, that it's uh, thought of as being very old, probably older than the 14th century, is because, of course, um, uh, it, it's, it's used so infrequently. It's used only in the mornings of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, right? So a couple of days a year, and then it gets put away. Uh, until we uh, until we use it again. By the way, some of you might also note that that's familiar to some other melodies that we use. Um, when you've heard me take out the Torah on weekdays, uh, if you come to Morning Minion, I use that melody. Uh, um, that is that's referred to as the High Holiday. Um, Torah Nusach, but uh, but it's it's generally used for weekdays. Usually, often we replace that. It, it should be used on Shabbat as well, but nobody does. We use, in fact, metrical tunes. We'll talk more about all this uh, next month. Um, but I wanted to, to just share that with you about Messini tunes. There are some, that, a, a select few that are very, very old, we, so old that we don't even really know how old they are. Uh, I mentioned also Shirat Hayam as being sort of that, that being in that category as well. Um, so I, I want to point out also that there's no. When we're talking about Jewish music, it's worth noting that Jewish music means a lot of different things. And we're going, I'm going to, I'm going to start playing more examples, but please note, as I said, so I know the, um, the, uh, the Ashkenazi, Eastern European Ashkenazi tradition best. And there are a lot of variations even within that, but that's different, let's say from what they did in the synagogue in Central Europe or what they did in, in Yemen or Iraq or Morocco and those uh, those uh, Eastern groups are all different from each other, different from the Westerns, Faradim, uh, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and there are subgroups. There's a, there's a group of, of Jews from that were from Greece called Romaniote. Uh, there, there's one synagogue in uh, in in New York that uh, that they have their own set of melodies. Um, the Turkish Jews who came from Spain had their own set of melodies. And by the way, um, another thing that that we that we have no idea about prior to more recent times is uh, is non synagogue music. Right? So there are various reasons why liturgical music gets written down, but synagogue music that is, or, or sorry, uh, Jewish music that is not based in the synagogue is also um, Jewish music. Uh, and so that includes folk song and art song and, uh, and, and uh, I mean, the whole range of other sort of cultural things, liturgical music that's not meant for the synagogue. And I'll give you some examples of that as well. I wanted to, um, to tell you that that we, the Jews, have always been sort of interested in in our own musical history, as we're generally interested in our own history um, uh, because of the character of our of our tradition. Uh, and um, and there was uh, in uh, in one of the people I studied in cantorial school who uh, who is the forerunner of uh, of scholarship on this subject is 
a cantor, Avraham Tzvi Edelson, who wrote uh, this book, Jewish Music, among other books, Jewish Music in its, histor historical, de or its historical Development, in which he gives a lot of history. Um, Edelson uh, lived, he was actually born in Latvia, and uh, he was bitten by the Zionist bug and immigrated to Palestine in 1905. 1905. There aren't, aren't a lot of Jews in living in Palestine at that time, but there, there are more that are coming on the waves of Aliyah. Uh, and so he, he, he lives in Jerusalem in that period, in the first and second decades of the 20th century. And he um, actually studied all, he, he was the first person to uh, go to many, many different cantors at the, at the many synagogues that there were in Jerusalem and write down their musical traditions. So, um, uh, so, so, Edelson created um, a 10 volume set of, of those of that stuff that he'd written down, which is still a, uh, of great value to scholars today. Um, but one thing that he did uh, that Edelson did, which is controversial, is that he said, uh, again, again, he's writing in the 20s. Uh, he said that all of the music that we hear today amongst Jews from different communities, it all relates back to one single tradition that that existed when uh, when all the Jews were still together in the Second Temple period, you know. And over two thousand years, they went off all they were spread out all over the world, uh, and that and and all and you can hear echoes of uh, of that music in uh, in all of their traditions. So he created, for example, I'm, I'm trying to show you a, um, a, a a chart, the kind of charts that he created that showed that like. That, for example, trope systems or Torah chanting systems from all over the world were uh, were, were all related to each other. So the um, so the, the the trope system of the Yemenite Jews uh, is uh, uh, yeah. So so this is an example you can see here on this page. He mentions the here's a Sephardic tune, here's a Moroccan tune, and here's an Italian tune. Uh, here's a the tune from the Sephardim of London and etc. Um, Carpentras in, uh, in in southern France. Um, and uh, and he wanted to show that all of those tunes were somehow related, that tunes for different texts were maintained from this ancient tradition. Unfortunately, later scholars debunked Edelson and said, eh, sorry, not really. The, the truth is that wherever the Jews went, they absorbed much of the musical tradition of the people around them. Now, uh, in the Ashkenazi, again, we'll, we'll talk about this more month, next month, but you, I, I'll, I'll point out, for example, where uh, where melodies that we use are derived, let's say, from Polish tradition versus Arabic or Turkish tradition. And we have that in, in Ashkenazi, in Eastern European Ashkenazi uh, synagogue music. But um, it's it, it, you can't really make the case that they're all related to this is how it was in the temple. And then, you know, and then everybody's uh, still sing, effectively singing that those those melodies just that they've been uh, transformed over time. Um, so uh, so in any case, um, yes, Jews all over the world have had their own kinds of music, many kinds of music. And I want to give just uh, just a taste of what those kinds of music are. Uh, there's one more question I see. Um, a uh, couple of questions. Notations about um, King David's harp. I, I, I don't I don't think that that exists. Uh, good question. Um, music change. Uh, did the music change much during Babylonian exile? Yes. Yeah, so I would say that um, Abby, I can't answer that question directly um, about how how the music might have changed in the Babylonian exile. But certainly the Jews were in Babylon long enough to have heard the music of their non-Jewish neighbors. And 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 where and, and that would have been true wherever the Jews have moved. So you think about it today. You go to a, a, a you go to Beth Shalom. It's possible that an American folk tune might sneak it might have snuck into our services. Uh, you know there are certain people who use modern nigunim. Uh, the, the the nigunim that we know, even though they they're derived from a Hasidic tradition of singing wordless melodies, they are they're using the the musical modes and 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 styles that we're all familiar with today because we listen to American pop music, um, and so or, or, or contemporary pop music. So so wherever we've gone, we've absorbed that music and adopted it, um, and that is to been been some extent. Uh, Unavoidable, but also in some cases even controversial. Also, another uh, a, a plug for next uh, next time. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Jews may also have influenced the music of others where they live. That is that is certainly correct. And in fact, um, uh, one example would be uh, the composers like uh, Max Bruch, who wrote the uh, the elaboration on 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 Kol Nidre. Um, uh, he was not Jewish, uh, but he was a he was a Protestant composer, German composer who heard Kol Nidre and thought, oh. What a great tune! And he borrows the tune and he and he uh, elaborates on it. Um, 
but music is one of those things that easily crosses um, easily crosses boundaries, uh, um, boundaries of that, that other things don't cross. Let's say you know. Um, so 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 um, uh, that that's something that is that has been throughout our history. Um, <laughs> that, thank you, Michael, for that comment about uh, yes, you you there. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, so I want to give you uh, more examples. We talked a little bit about trope. I, I give you an example, of sort of the range of Jewish music. I, I want to give you, by the way, Edelson's definition of what Jewish music is. He says the following. Jewish music is the song of Judaism through the lips of the Jew. It is the tonal expression of Jewish life and development over a period of more than 2000 years. Okay? So so he doesn't now he doesn't say anything about liturgy or synagogue or ritual. He says the song of Judaism through the lips of the Jew. Okay? So hold that in your head and think about what, what that might mean as we listen to some of these musical examples. So something I'd like to play for you. This is, uh, this is something from Salomone de Rossi. Oh, um, actually, uh, just make sure. Yeah, we, we, we mentioned trope. I mentioned nusach, meaning the prayer chant melody that we use in synagogue. Um, we'll talk more about that next time. Uh, metrical tunes, tunes uh, are, are, are all, all the melodies we know that are metrical, I mean, like where you sing along, none of that existed prior to about 150 years ago. They're all pretty much brand new in terms of Jewish life. Um, Kol Nidre is not a sing-along tune. It's old. It's not a sing-along tune. Um, the, uh, the, all that idea of congregational singing is, br is brand new, effectively. Um, the uh, uh, and so I want to play with you, play for you something that that actually is one of the earliest known examples of composed music for the synagogue. This is from Salomone de Rossi, who is a um, who is a court composer in uh, is it Verona or Mantua in in, in Italy, uh, and uh, and he also is he's Jewish. He comes from an Italian Jewish family, and not only did he write secular music for um, for this uh, for this court where he worked, but also he wrote. Jewish music. So here is Baruch Hu. Here is his Baruch Hu. Oops. Oh, wait. No, don't stop. Um, so that, of course, sounds um, like the uh, early 17th century in which it was written. Um, fabulous. Uh, uh, Rossi obviously uh, composed many, many, two. Uh, actually, I think it's a total of, yeah, it's 33 uh, melodies. He was controversial. I'm going to leave it. I will leave that for next time because it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, but so that's an example of composed music for the synagogue, not necessarily sung by the congregants, let's say, but sung by a choir. Um, and it's it's notably, by the way, unaccompanied, no instruments. Remember that instruments were used in the temple for uh, until probably the 20th century, uh, 19th century is when some uh, organs were used. Um, and, and then, of course, in the 20th century, for many, many centuries, Jews did not use instruments in the synagogue. Not necessarily, if you ask many Orthodox Jews, why don't you use an instrument in the synagogue on Shabbat? They'll say, oh, it's because if you break a string, you might want to fix it. And that's, you know, forbidden on Shabbat. Probably not. Actually, it's because they were because the instruments were associated with the joyful sounds of uh, of the temple. Um, and and uh, and they were they were therefore eliminated from Jewish life. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to hurry because we're, we're running low on time. Oh, this is a. Pause. Pause, pause. Uh, this is a, this is a Yossel Rosenblatt. 
not music composed for the synagogue, but liturgical music. So now we're obviously we're into the 20th century. Um, Yosel Rosenblatt is one of the greatest cantors of the, of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and this is a melody that many of us know so, so well known. Again, not composed for synagogue use, but it's a psalm. It's uh, Psalm 137. Uh, it's the one that we sing before Birkat Amazon. Um, uh, and, uh, and this was a serious candidate for uh, for the um, for the uh, um, uh, national anthem of the state of Israel, it was not adopted. Uh, rather, Hatikva in, instead was adopted. But. <laughs> I would love to play more of that. I just that that melody makes me cry. It's so beautiful. Um, but uh, but really, um, Rosenblatt. What's interesting about this melody and many of the other uh, in in this particular period is that cantors sang not only, of course, in the synagogue, but they also recorded th things that were um, of a cantorial cantorial nature. For that, but we're not necessarily used in the synagogue. No one in the synagogue is really going to use that because it's more of a showpiece. It's for concerts. And it, and it sort of crosses the line between what you might call pop song or folk song uh, versus synagogue song. So there, there's there's one example there. Um, I, I'm going to play. So so some real folk song is, uh, of course, there's a great tradition of, uh, wait, that's not the one I want to play you. Um, actually, this is a, yeah, I'm going to share with you uh, just a, a song that uh, that many of you may know. Um, that uh, that is uh, from from the uh, sphere of Yiddish folk song, and uh, and of course uh, it, the Yiddish folk song is is uh, is actually the, some of the most powerful uh, and beautiful folk songs there are. Um, but there are of course folk songs from all over the world. There are Ju Judeo Arabic folk songs, and there are Ladino folk songs. And but this is one that some of you may know. In the Mesamikdash in Avin Gulcheder sits the Almone Bastion Alem. Here when you're little Victi Caseder, but sing to him to him Schlofen a leader. I knew you. Okay, so Roshin Gizmit Mandlin is a classic, uh, classic Yiddish folk song. It's actually, it's actually much of what we think of as Yiddish folk is actually composed for the Yiddish theater. Um, and, uh, and that was one such example actually composed in 1880 for the operetta Shalamis. Um, but uh, one of those songs that became so popular that it, that it was effectively folk song. Um, I, uh, I, I actually mentioned that one in particular because I want you to compare it with uh, something else here. I got a little special uh, uh, video, but I actually, in order to play a video, I have to, I have to optimize for video. Hold on one second, get this going. Um, and, uh, and this, um, this melody uh, is, uh, you will see, um, not thought of as a Jewish tune, but is certainly um, and certainly borrows heavily. It was composed uh, by Irving Berlin uh, and uh, was uh, was composed for um, uh, for the for the people that knew Rojan Kismet Bandlin. They got this. Okay, you ready? Oops, here we go. And. <laughs> Never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw things 
going so right. Noticing the day, far and by, when you're in love, oh, don't it fly. Blue day, 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 all of them gone, nothing but blue skies from now on. Okay, so uh, obviously that's that's Al Jolson from the Jazz Singer, um, first uh, first talkie, uh, right? And um, what, again, what he's doing there, uh, it, it's built into the plot. The plot is, of course, he's the son of a cantor um, who leaves home and you know wants to make a living as a jazz singer. And when he comes back to visit his mother, uh, he sings that song in particular because of its association. You know, she would have recognized it. Wait a minute, this is Rojan Kismit Mandlin. Uh, although it's uh, it's in English and he's playing this jazzy piano, right? So it's a uh, it's um it, it's clearly again for those who knew Yiddish song, it was showing that I have my roots in the old world, um, but I'm but I'm an American now, I'm, uh, You know, I'm I'm gonna make it as a jazz singer. Um, so uh, so that would be an example. I, so the question that we have before us is that Jewish music, again, not in Hebrew, not explicitly Jewish, sung by a Jewish person, composed by a Jewish composer who based it on. Um, Jewish folk motifs. Um, so uh, you could make the case that maybe it's Jewish music. Um, how about how about this one then? Is uh, let's see if let's see if this one, if you might think of this as Jewish music. Uh, hold on, I got a screenshot. Oops, wait, wait, gotta do this right. Make sure I do this right. Um, optimize your video. All right, get ready. This is also by Irving Berlin. All right, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> the question is, is is that Jewish music? And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, you could make the case written by a Jewish composer um, uh, and uh, hold on, let me stop this. Uh, written by a Jewish composer um, for a mass market audience, you know, um, again, in Irving Berlin, new, new Jewish music, Jewish music, maybe. Um, uh, here's, um, I, I wanted to give you some examples of those. I want to give you also an example of Ladino song um, because uh, that is, there's, uh, again, I, I know I know the the Eastern European Ashkenazi uh, uh, tradition well. Uh, when I was in uh, cantorial school, I had a class in ethnomusicology, and we covered to some extent uh, non-Ashkenazi tunes. This is something from a from a um, uh, from a festival. It's called Festival Festival HaOud, the Oud Festival in Israel. Um, uh, this was actually this says November of 2020, so it's uh, a year ago. Um, and uh, and this, this group is going to be playing us a, uh, a classic Ladino song that's actually uh, from the Turkish uh, Ladino speaking community um, about, uh, about uh, it's something about drafting people into the, into the Turkish army. I got words for it too, I believe. Get the, you get the idea. Um, very different from what we're accustomed to in the uh, in the Eastern European uh, Jewish world, of course. Um, but long tradition. There are in in uh, in the uh, Ladino speaking world, there are traditions of secular songs uh, that were passed down from from for generations and generations, going all the way back to Spain from uh, from more than a half a millennium ago. Um, and uh, and today there are there are you know uh, groups that that sort of that, that record these things and uh, and perform them and so forth uh, because you know we we like learning about our history. Um, a lot of that work is in Israel. 
Uh, in fact, um, the, the guy who was speaking right before she before the group started to play was one of my professors, uh, Edwin Sarusi, who teaches at the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew University uh, and runs their Jewish Music Research Center, where they collect all this stuff from all over the world. Um, again, I'm just trying to give you some examples of different types of Jewish music so that we can sort of discuss the, the range and get a sense. One more thing I want to play, one more musical example, then we can perhaps take a few questions uh, and I'll tell you what's coming up next. This is, um, this is a, uh, so I, I mentioned earlier that I, that I uh, have, a, have a love for Israeli pop. Um, this is a tune that uh, was a big hit a couple of years ago um, for uh, Hadag Nachash, which is a, an Israeli hip hop group. Uh, and uh, and some of you might know this. Um, what it does what it does is it takes um, a, a, a slogans for that you find on bumper stickers, uh, all or political slogans. And and what's interesting about the video uh, is that it puts them in the mouths of the people least likely to be saying those political slogans. Um, I, I I can't show you all the words because that uh, that won't work. But anyway, you you might just appreciate this. Here we go. Okay, so uh, um, I I I, uh, I hope you appreciate. Uh oh, are you there? Are you there? Oh no. Um, I'm I'm not seeing you, which means okay. Did did you all did you see that? Were you able to see the clip? Did we see the clip? Sort of. Uh, okay. Well, all right. Some of you were. I'm sorry. I guess we're having internet because we're having internet issues. Um, but uh, what I wanted to uh, to to just uh, drive home is that um, again, Israeli pop music is, you might make the case, in the sphere of Jewish music, uh, and yet, oh boy, uh, again, you're, you're frozen, so I'm worried that you're not hearing me. Um, so uh, Israeli, Israeli pop music is in the sphere of Jewish music as well, because, hey, it's produced by Jews, it's coming out of the mouths of Jews as part of Jewish culture, so I think it's fair to say that would be uh, Israeli music. But, of course, that you might you might make the case that weren't even really singing, right? Because it's hip hop. So uh, so therefore, is it music if they're not really singing the way we think of as singing? Um, so uh, again, lots of ponderables there. Um, I, uh, I again, uh, you might want to, that that song is called the sticker song or Shirat Sticker in Hebrew. Um, if you want to dig into it a little more, I, I don't have time for that. It's very interesting because um, it has like. Uh, an, an Arab singing "The Arabs uh, Endanger Israel," and and the uh, and the, um, uh, the 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 religious person is saying "Gius uh, lechulam." Everybody should go to uh, everybody should be uh, should be inducted into the army. You know, so it's again, it's uh, it's ironic in that the people who you do not expect to be saying those uh, slogans to be saying them, and they're really they're very hard. They're just sort of like yelling them at each other. It's a anyway, it's a very interesting song. Um, so uh, I'm I'm uh, again sorry that we're having some uh, some connection. issues issues. Um, but oh, and thank you, Michael, for posting that uh, the, with the, uh, the words to the, uh, the sticker song. Um, so I'll tell you what, um, I, uh, so I, just a couple minutes left and then I got to run. Uh, the, our next session in December, first Tuesday in December is Music of the Synagogue. We'll be talking about that. 
Um, January, we'll do uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do some chazanut listening uh, to listen to various cantors doing their thing. Um, February, we're going to talk about folk and art song. I didn't get to, I had some other folk song, some art song queued up, but we'll, we'll get to that eventually. And then in March, we'll do sort of a, a history and survey of Israeli pop music, um, which is always a lot of fun. Um, so uh, one question, is there a good source for listening to Israeli pop music, especially in the car? Oh, boy. Um, uh, you know what? Um, Nowadays, there are these streaming services. If you type in Israeli music, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, you might want to um, check out through in the internet, internet radio. Uh, you can get all sorts of uh, Israeli radio stations nowadays, and you can just listen to whatever there is. A good place to start is uh, um, Gal Galatz is a popular Israeli, uh, uh, is a popular Israeli um, station, although they mix they, they mix uh, Israeli music with foreign music. Um, if you can find Reshet Gimel, uh, the uh, Gimel channel, um, they, play only, uh, they play only Israeli pop music. Um, so uh, that would be a good resource. Um, you could probably find that online. Um, how, what does the notation indicate? How long to hold? Oh, uh, you're, you asked about the, um, that was about Nooms. Uh, I, I don't really know the answer to those questions about how, how uh, Ovadia Hager wrote out his music and, and how to interpret that. People who study that, you know, are, are, know that. Uh, Spotify is Stones of Player. Good, good to know that you can, on Spotify, you can find, um, yeah, Israeli, uh, Israeli playlists. So you can listen to that. Um, and uh, let's see. So, um, yeah, uh, somebody mentioned Matis Yahu. Matis Yahu, of course, uh, is, is Jewish, uh, sings um, pop music, or say, I don't know if he's still doing this, was singing pop music that was uh, based in sort of in Jewish ideas and values and sometimes Jewish texts. So I would say that's certainly clearly in the Jewish music um, camp. Uh, but of course, he had a lot of pop success as well. So, you know, uh, good good for him. Um, uh, Beth Jacobs mentions Ocho, Ocho Candelicas as a, as a, a Ladino song for Hanukkah, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, that is, I believe, written, either written by or, or written down by Flori Jagoda, who is a um, uh, who, who was, I think she passed away, uh, wrote down many, many Ladino songs from her uh, background in Sarajevo. Um, Sarajevo and Istanbul were, I think, the two biggest centers of, uh, of Ladino music, of people that maintained Ladino music. Um, so uh, we will uh, we'll cover more of all of these things. This was just a survey today to give you a sense of what, uh, you know, to, to ask the question, what is Jewish music? To sort of reinforce the idea that uh, music crosses uh, cultural boundaries all the time. And so the reason that that Ladino piece sounded very different from what uh, what was occurring just really, uh, you know, uh, less than a thousand miles away uh, in Poland, um, very different, but uh, but nonetheless, both firmly in the sphere of Jewish music, um, because wherever the Jews have gone, they have soaked up uh, the stuff around them. Um, uh, and uh, I got to I got to wrap this up. But uh, it was a pleasure learning with you all today. Uh, I, you know that I like to conclude with Kadish Rabbanan. So I'm going to uh, pull that up on screen. Uh, and uh, hold on. And we can recite that together. Because remember, music is also Torah. So uh, that's here. Um, please rise for Kadish Rabbanan. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash, Shemeraba, Bealama, Divra, Kirute, Veamlich Malhute, Bechaye Hon, Uviomehon, Ufaye, the whole Beit Israel, Bagala, Uvisman, Kariv, Vimru, Amen. Yehe, Shemeraba, Mevarach, Lealam, Rame, Alamaya. Yit Barach, Yishtabach, Vit Paar, Vit Roman, Vit Asse, Vit Adar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shemed, Kucha, Brehu. La Ella min Kolbir Hata, Vishirata, Tushpe Hata, Venechamata, Damiran Balama, Vimru, Amen. Al Yisrael, Val Rabanan, Val Tamide Hon, Val Kol Talmide Tamide Hon, Val Kol Mande Asakin Beoraita, Diva Tra Haden, Vediva Hol Atar Vatar, Yehe Lahon Ulhon Shalama Raba, Hina Vista Rahamin, Vehain Arihin, Mzonar Viha, Ufur Kana Min Kodam Mavon Nivishmaya, Vimru, Amen, Yehe Shalama Raba Min Shemaya, Vehaim Tovim, Malenu, Al Kol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen, Ose Shalom, Vimramav, Hubrahamav, Yase Shalom, Alenu, Al Kol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I will see you all soon. Take care, stay healthy. And uh, keep listening to Jewish music. Ashika.